One more interesting character in this study. De Broglie was a French scientist, all right, and he proposed that all moving objects have wave properties. Now, people since Einstein had said, okay, well, yeah, electrons, maybe they'll have this wave particle duality and stuff like that and do it. But nobody had thought that all moving objects have this. So what he did was really clever. One of Einstein's equations is E equals mc squared, and he realized that Planck's equation was E equals HC over lambda. And you'll notice that both of these have an E. So we essentially let MC squared equal HC over lambda. I mean, it's so simple, but he was the only one to think about it. Now, uh, as you can see, you can cancel out us one of the speed of lights. And because he's talking about particles, all right, or, or um, all moving objects, um, objects aren't supposed to move at the speed of light. This is another one of Einstein's thing. So what he did is he substituted in for the speed of light, once he cut it out, he substituted in for the speed of light, he substituted in the velocity. So V here is the velocity in meters per second. All right. And in physics, this would be like how they measure how fast things go and stuff. And when he rearranged it, he got lambda equals H over MV. And at first you're like, oh yeah, whatever. That's great. But this is an uh, object with mass, and the units for mass in this particular problem are kilograms, we're going to see. But anyway, an object with mass, and that object with mass traveling at speed v is going to have a wavelength. And if you saw me walking down the aisle of Fred Meyers or Safeway, um, what this is saying is that in theory, you should be able to see me having a wavelength, <laughs> like walking like that. And and that's just like, what the? <laughs> All right. And it's not because I've been drinking or something like that, that I'm like staggering around the aisles. All right. This is because objects with mass M should have wavelengths associated with them. And this like blew people away. Now, de Broglie was writing his PhD thesis and he did this little e equals MC squared equals HC over lambda thing. And he basically created a seven page PhD thesis. Now I'm emphasizing this because my PhD thesis was like 400 pages, man. It took a long time to write. And this, mm, he's seven pages. Anyway, he sent this to his committee and the committee really didn't know what to do with it. So they sent it to Einstein who had talked about, well, maybe there's this wave particle duality. Einstein looked at it and go, whoa, he goes, give this guy his PhD. And de Broglie became a powerhouse in science. And again, the idea behind de Broglie is that objects with mass m and speed v are going to have a wavelength associated with them. Whoa! This is an example of how this stuff works out. Let's say you want to calculate the wavelength of an electron traveling at 75% the speed of light. So objects aren't supposed to go the speed of light. That's one of the things that makes Star Trek people mad, but that's another thing. But anyway, it's Einstein's thing and I respect Einstein. But anyway, so we're going to use wavelength equals Planck's constant H divided by MV. And if you throw these parts in, and you may have to look up some of these numbers, this number we talked about in chapter two, part one, real fast. This is the mass of a single electron. And it's certainly not a number that you have to know, but it's 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. We also talked about in the last section, how a joule is what they call a derived SI unit. And a joule is a kilogram meters squared per second squared. So because the joule has the kilogram in it, the mass here has to be kilogram as well. Most of the time in chemistry, using mass in grams is okay, but not in this particular part. So use kilograms with de Broglie. Anyway, speed of light, you, we've already talked about that. 75% would be 0 0.750. So throw all of this in your calculator. And I do encourage you to do that just to make sure your math skills are good. You end up with a wavelength 3.23 times 10 to the minus 12 meters. And believe it or not, that is a wavelength which can be measured. It it is a measurable wavelength for an electron traveling at that speed.
Here's the note again, how a joule is a kilogram meters squared per second squared. And so you have to use kilograms for the mass in these problems. And again, most of the time in chemistry, using grams is no problem, but here you have to use kilograms. Electrons have wave properties. If we shoot a beam of electrons through thin metal foil, the atoms of the foil cause the waves to interfere with each other. The interference, or diffraction pattern, can be recorded on photographic film as a series of concentric circles. This is essentially a source of electrons. They call it an electron gun. And electrons are particles. They have the mass, that 10 to the minus 31 kilograms we saw earlier. And if this was a true gun, and it fired a quote-unquote bullet, you would think it would go through the metal foil and go through to the other side and like hit right here, all right? And that would be it. But what you actually see see is that concentric circle pattern and that looks more like if you've ever thrown a rock in a still pond the waves kind of emanate out from out of that that's what it looks like electrons here are behaving like waves there are lots of examples where waves behave or electrons behave like waves you'd think they were particles more like the bullet from a gun right but in reality there are tons of examples now of where these crazy the electrons can be like waves and that's totally cool. So let's go back to me walking down the aisle and maybe like swaggering and you think, oh, is that too much to drink? No, it's just a broglie. Well, anyway, you don't see me doing that, okay? And that's okay. So let's say that you wanted to find the wavelength of a baseball traveling at 100 miles per hour. So you'd use uh, the wavelength equation for de Broglie. Wavelength equals H over MV. Turn the grams into kilograms. Turn the miles per hour into meters per second. And if you do that, you end up with a wavelength of 1.3 times 10 to the minus 32 centimeters. And that's an unmeasurable quantity by current technology standards. So we could not measure a baseball traveling at 100 miles per hour. We couldn't measure its wavelength. It's too massive and it's too slow, all right? Not gonna work. So that means if you see me walking in Safeway or Fred Meyers, you won't see any wavelength associated with it. All right, I'm too massive, all right? I have a too weird of a speed. Um, you're not gonna see a wavelength for me. On the other hand, if you have an electron traveling at a pretty good clip, 1.90 times 10 to the 8th, getting close to speed of light, that wavelength comes out to be 0.388 nanometers. And those are the kind of wavelengths you can measure. So it's basically for electrons, really small particles that de Broglie is appropriate. Um, electrons and light both exhibit wave particle duality. And again, that means that both electrons and light some Sometimes will act like waves and sometimes will act like particles. So the electron doesn't act in that little animation up there like a bullet from a gun. It acts like a wave and it goes through and makes that cool diffraction pattern pretty cool. Schrodinger was a major force in the development of wave or quantum mechanics. And again, Schrodinger is a really interesting kind of person. And he developed the idea of what's called a wave equation or wave functions. And they gave them symbol psi. And if you applied a certain type of math process, H, to the wave function psi, you would end up getting out the wave function and the energy, which was really, really cool. And they used to quantized energy functions. So instead of having continuous values, which is kind of like this slope would be right here, and that's what classical physics says, you can actually only have discrete values. This is analogous to what Bohr saw with levels of the atom, all right? There are only certain parts that are possible. You can't have all of them. Schrodinger is really interesting, but most of the stuff from here on in is going to be the result of Schrodinger and his other colleagues' work. That psi is really interesting. It describes the motion of the electron waves with location and time. And that quantization thing comes out naturally. So while Bohr kind of threw it in and said, well, this is what works, uh, Schrodinger actually saw that this comes out naturally. The math of Schrodinger is pretty intense, all right? And again, if um, we all had taken math 254, we could talk more about these things. Uh, but we haven't, and that was never the intent of Chem 2. 21. So just realize that when you do this higher level stuff, all of this comes out naturally. 
Here's some examples of that H psi equals E psi thing I babbled about earlier. And again, each of those psi wave functions has a distance and two angles. So if you've heard about like spherical coordinates or polar spherical coordinates and stuff like that, that's the kind of stuff that this will apply to. Now, more interestingly is that each of those wave function corresponds to an orbital. And an orbital is a term we're gonna use here pretty in pretty soon. So eat deck down here this little psi that would be an orbital and when you apply the function h function to it you get out some information but the orbital comes back and an orbital is just a region of space where the electron is found we're going to start talking about orbitals here in a little bit but without so much math <laughs> The wave function orbital does not describe the exact location of the electron. All right, we're going to see that the wave function orbitals are really good for finding the energy, but not so good for finding the location. However, because it's nice to know what the approximate location is, if you square that wave function, you get the probability of finding an electron at any given one point. So imagine that you have an office, all right, an office with a computer. Probably most of the time you're going to be close to the computer. So the psi star of that room, your office, would say that most of the time you're by your computer. But once in a while, maybe you're on the opposite wall looking out the window, all right, or once in a while you're down in the kitchen getting a drink, all right. Um, psi star just shows the probability of where you're going to be, but it doesn't always show you where you're going to be. We're going to see pictures of orbitals pretty soon that look something like a figure eight. And those figure eights mean that most of the time the electron is going to be somewhere in one of the orbs, if you will, of the or of that figure eight. But once in a while, the electron might be way off to the right, or maybe once in a while, it'll be looking out the window right there. Realize that psi star, the probability, is most of the time correct, but not all the time correct. And that's another interesting thing about quantum mechanics. One final person is important to talk about, and his name is Heisenberg. Heisenberg was actually a person that worked in Germany during World War II on their uh, nuclear bomb. And depending on who you talk to, Heisenberg was either a passionate person working on it or he was trying to prevent them from developing it. And I don't know what the answer is. But Heisenberg did come up with a really interesting idea called the uncertainty principle. And how he got this is quite complicated. But anyway, Anyway, what the Heisenberg uncertainty principle is all about is that you can't simultaneously know the position and the energy of an electron at the same time. It's really not just energy, it's momentum. Momentum is mass times velocity, but you can see in uh, science that momentum and energy are closely related, so people usually think about it as energy. So you can't know position and energy of an electron at the same time. Like you have to make a choice. You can know one or the other. Now chemists in, in chemistry, we're always interested in the energy. All right. So if it comes to the choice, the chemist will want to know the energy of the electron as close to a value as we can. But if you pick energy, then that means you don't necessarily know the position well. So we might know exactly what it takes to go from n equals 1 to n equals 2. All right, that delta E, we've got it nailed down. We've made that choice. However, if it comes to an electron in an s orbital, which basically look like spheres, all right, most of the time it's going to be within that sphere somewhere. We don't know where, but most of the time it's going to be inside there. But even most of the time means once in a while it'll be outside there or maybe down there or up here, all right? It's going to be all over the place. Place. So Heisenberg's uncertainty principle says we have to make a choice and we choose as chemists energy over the position. So there's always going to be a little uncertainty about where the electron is.
Heisenberg, uh, like I said, some people think he was a, a hardcore Nazi. Other people say he was trying to prevent the Nazis from developing the bomb. I will let you decide that. Um, I go back and forth in my opinion of Heisenberg. However, the uncertainty principle is very, very interesting. There's another relationship with Heisenberg when it comes to time, which is also really fascinating. So he's definitely a powerhouse when it comes to science. Um, how you feel about his politics is a conversation conversation for you to have at a different time. A familiar depiction of the atom shows electrons orbiting the nucleus like planets around the sun. This model is neither accurate nor useful. We no longer think of electrons as orbiting the nucleus, and we cannot predict their location with accuracy. A more useful model is the quantum mechanical view of the atom, which represents the positions of electrons in terms of their probability of being in a particular region around the nucleus. If we could show all positions for an electron with a specific quantized energy, the resulting picture would look something like a cloud. That's a pretty important video. In the old days, uh, chemists and scientists thought that electrons circled the atom like planets around the sun. And that's totally understandable. It's an early motor mo idea for the atom, all right? Um, however, classical physics, which works really well for planets around the sun because gravity is the main force, that doesn't work very well when you have positive and negative charges. So negative electrons, positive protons. That's the electrostatic force. And electrostatic force means eventually electrons would basically burn the atom up. They would go off crazy or they'd collapse and stuff like that. It's a bad thing. So instead of having the planets around the sun idea, which is still used in a lot of classic 1950s nuclear chemistry kind of things, if you've ever looked on the Simpsons and stuff like that, which is fine, what they feel is that really electrons have a probability field. And that's kind of like this big circled area here. Those little dots right there, those are places where the electron could be. That's the probable region in where the electrons are going to be. Now, sometimes the electrons could be over here, over here, over here. That darned uncertainty principle, we just don't always know. We know their energies really, really well, but we don't always know their probability. So the atom has gone through many transitions, right? It hasn't been a stable kind of thing. We started with like the plum pudding kind of model where individual little atoms maybe ran around and there was some kind of interaction between them. Then we went to the Bohr model, which literally was any equals one and equals two and equals three stuff like that but that didn't work out too well and now we have this probability field this shimmering kind of thing now there's nothing wrong with writing it as the Bohr model I completely understand but do realize it's not very accurate it's more accurate to have those little tiny dot 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 dots around but of course that's kind of frustrating and stuff to draw as a teacher trying to get an idea across so obviously it's not used as much the classical planets around the sun idea just didn't work. Gravity is different than electrostatics, positives and negatives. The things that are happening on the atomic world are quite different than the things that are happening in the world of planets and suns and moons and stuff like that. So it's a whole different thing. It was a great idea to start off, but not so well in the long run. So in this field, we've seen some huge names in science. Planck, Max Planck Institute, E equals H nu. Bohr did the sharp line spectra and stuff like that. De Broglie, uh, seven page thesis, I'm still jealous, but he saw that all particles have a wavelength. Schrodinger, oh my gosh, quantum mechanics is just huge. We haven't even begun to touch it. We're gonna look at it a little bit more. Heisenberg, even though he was a Nazi, he did do the uncertainty principle, which is pretty freaking awesome. And Einstein, oh my gosh, he's one of the premiers scientists of all time. These are the giants of quantum physics, and it might seem kind of intimidating and stuff to see them all here. But I want to remind you all at this point that all of these guys and the other women like Marie Curie who helped out, all of them are human. This is kind of a fun picture I found of Heisenberg and Bohr, and they were dining in Copenhagen in 1934. And you can see here they're having a good time, but what I'd like you to see, if you can see it, is the bottle of beer right there. That's Carlsberg beer, and I am not advocating for you to start drinking by any means. However, Carlsberg beer is still the beer that's around. And so you can see these guys are kind of hanging out, having some really nerdy conversations 
conversations, having Carlsberg beer and drinking coffee and all these kind of things. These dudes are just as human as you are and myself as well and stuff like that. So Heisenberg and Bohr did all the normal things they did. They all took chemistry 221 or the equivalent at one time or another. All right. They didn't just start off with an instant, you know, uh, database of cool science things. They had to work through it. So they were all where you are right now. And I want to remind you of that because your great things, a lot of them have yet to happen and they will happen soon. One of my favorite expressions, argue for your limitations and they are yours. So if you start arguing for the things you can't do, yeah, you're not going to do them. All right. They're not going to start happening. So try and remember this. All right. Some great things are going to happen in your world and you could be one of the great scientists that I'll talk about one day. You never know, but don't limit yourself. Go after your dreams. Okay, Professor Hot, kind of getting a little crazy there. I apologize, but I'm always trying. You know, you guys are pretty cool to me. Okay, back to your regular scheduled programming. 